Chapters 11 and 12 of The Angel of Terror. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Angel of Terror by Edgar Wallace. Chapter 11. Jean Briggerland had spent a very busy afternoon. There had been a string of callers at the handsome house in Berkeley Street. Mr. Briggerland was of a philanthropic bent, and had instituted a club in the East End of London, which was intended to raise the moral tone of Limehouse, Wapping, Poplar, and the adjacent districts. It was started without ostentation, with a man named Fayed as a general manager. Mr. Fayed had had in his lifetime several hectic contests with the police, in which he had been invariably the loser and it was in his role as a reformed character that he undertook the management of this social uplift club. Well-meaning police officials had warned Mr. Briggerland that Fayed had a bad character. Mr. Briggerland listened, was grateful for the warning, but explained that Fayed had come under the influence of the new uplift movement, and, from henceforward, he would be an exemplary citizen. Later, the police had occasion to extend their warning to its founder. The club was being used by known criminal characters, men who had already been in jail and were qualifying for a return visit. Again, Mr. Briggerland pointed to the object of the institution, which was to bring bad men into the society of good men and women and to arouse them in a desire for better things. He quoted a famous text with great effect, but still the police were unconvinced. It was the practice of Miss Jean Briggerland to receive selected members of the club and to entertain them at tea in Berkeley Street. Her friends thought it was very sweet and very daring and wondered whether she wasn't afraid of catching some kind of disease peculiar to the East End of London. But Jean did not worry about such things. On this afternoon, after the last of her callers had gone, she went down to the little morning room where such entertainments occurred, and found two men who rose awkwardly as she entered. The gentle influence of the club had not made them look anything but what they were. Jailbird was written all over them. "'I'm very glad you men have come,' said Jean sweetly. "'Mr. Hoggins?' "'That's me, miss,' said one with a grin." And Mr. Talmot? The second man showed his teeth. I'm always glad to see members of the club, said Jean, busy with the teapot, especially men who have had so bad a time as you have. You have only just come out of prison, haven't you, Mr. Hoggins? She asked innocently. Hoggins went red and coughed. Yes, miss, he said huskily, and added inconsequently, I didn't do it. I'm sure you were innocent she said with a smile of sympathy and really if you were guilty i don't think you men are so much to blame look at what a bad time you have what disadvantages you suffer whilst here in the west end people are wasting their money that really ought to go to your wives and children that's right said mr hoggins there's a girl i know who is tremendously rich Jean prattled on. She lives at 84 Cavendish Mansions, just on the top floor, and, of course, she's very foolish to sleep with her windows open, especially as people could get down from the roof. There is a fire escape there. She always has a lot of jewelry, keeps it under her pillow, I think, and there is generally a few hundred pounds scattered about the bedroom. Now that is what I call putting temptation in the way of the weak. She lifted her blue eyes, saw the glitter in the man's eyes, and went on. I have told her lots of times that there is danger, but she only laughs. There is an old man who sleeps in the house, quite a feeble old man, who only has the use of one arm. Of course, if she cried out, I suppose he would come to her rescue. But then, a real burglar wouldn't let her cry out, would he? She asked. The two men looked at one another. No breathed one especially as they could get clean away if they were clever said jean and it isn't likely they would leave her in a condition to betray them is it <clears throat> mr hoggins cleared his throat it's not very likely miss he said jean shrugged her shoulders 
"'Women do these things, and then they blame the poor man "'to whom a thousand pounds would be a fortune "'because he comes and takes it. "'Personally, I should not like to live at eighty-four Cavendish Mansions.' Eighty-four Cavendish Mansions,' murmured Mr. Hoggins absent-mindedly. "'His last sentence had been one of ten years' penal servitude. "'His next sentence would be for life. "'Nobody knew this better than Jean Briggerland, "'as she went on to talk of the club "'and of the wonderful work which it was doing. "'She dismissed her visitors and went back to her sitting-room. "'As she turned to go up the stairway, her maid intercepted her. "'Mary is in your room, miss,' she said in a low voice. "'Jean frowned, but made no reply. "'The woman, who stood awkwardly in the center of the room awaiting the girl, "'greeted her with an apologetic smile. "'I'm sorry, miss,' she said, "'but I lost my job this morning. "'That old man spotted me. "'He's a split, a detective.' "'Jean Briggerland regarded her with an unmoved face.' save that her beautiful mouth took on the pathetic little droop which had excited the pity of a judge and an army of lawyers. "'When did this happen?' she asked. "'Last night, miss. He came, and I got a bit cheeky to him, and then he turned on me, the old devil, and told me my real name, and that I'd got a job by forging recommendations.' Jean sat down slowly in the padded Venetian chair before her writing table. "'Jags?' she asked yes miss and why didn't you come here at once i thought i might be followed miss the girl bit her lip and nodded you did quite right she said and then after a moment's reflection we shall be in paris next week you had better go by the night train and wait for us at the flat she gave the maid some money and after she had gone, sat for an hour before the fire, looking into its red depths. She rose at last a little stiffly, pulled the heavy silken curtain across the windows, and switched on the light, and there was a smile on her face that was very beautiful to see, for in that hour came an inspiration. She sought her father in his study, and told him her plan, and he blanched and shivered with the very horror of it. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 Mr. Briggerland, it seemed, had some other object in life than the regeneration of the criminal classes. He was a sociologist, a loose title which covers a great deal of inquisitive investigation into other people's affairs. Moreover, he had published a book on the subject. His name was on the title page, and the book had been reviewed to his credit, though, in truth, he did no more than suggest the title, the work in question having been carried out by a writer on the subject who, for a consideration, had allowed Mr. Briggerland to adopt the child of his brain. On a morning when pale yellow sunlight brightened his dining room, Mr. Briggerland put down his newspaper and looked across the table at his daughter. He had a club in the East End of London, and his manager had telephoned that morning, sending a somewhat unhappy report. "'Do you remember that man, Talmot, my dear?' he asked. She nodded and looked up quickly. "'Yes, what about him?' "'He's in the hospital,' said Mr. Briggerland. "'I fear that he and Hoggins were engaged in some nefarious plan, and that in making an attempt to enter, as of course they had no right to enter, a block of flats in Cavendish Place. Poor Talamut slipped and fell from the fourth floor window sill, breaking his leg. Hoggins had to carry him to the hospital. The girl reached for bacon from the hot plate. He should have broken his neck, she said calmly. I suppose now the police are making tender inquiries? No, no. Mr. Briggerland hastened to assure her. Nobody knows anything about it. Not even the, uh, er, fortunate occupant of the flat they were evidently trying to burgle. I only learned of it because the manager of the club, who gets information of this character, thought I would be interested. Anyway, I'm glad they didn't succeed, said Jean after a while. The possibility of their trying rather worried me. The Hoggins type is such a burglar that it was almost certain they would fail. 
it was a curious fact that whilst her father made the most guarded references to all their exploits and clothed them with garments of euphemism his daughter never attempted any such disguise the psychologist would find in mr briggerland's reticence the embryo of a once dormant rectitude no trace of which remained in his daughter's moral equipment i have been trying to place this man jaggs she went on with a little puzzled frown and he completely baffles me he arrives every night in a taxicab sometimes from st pancras sometimes from euston sometimes from london bridge station do you think he's a detective i don't know she said thoughtfully if he is he has been imported from the provinces he is not a scotland yard man he may of course be an old police pensioner and i have been trying to trace him from that source it should not be difficult to find out all about him said mr briggerland easily a man with his afflictions should be pretty well known he looked at his watch my appointment at norwood is at eleven o'clock he said he made a little grimace of disgust would you rather i went asked the girl mr briggerland would much rather that she had undertaken the disagreeable experience which lay before him but he dare not confess as much you my dear of course not i would not allow you to have such an experience no no i don't mind it a bit nevertheless he tossed down two long glasses of brandy before he left his car set him down before the iron gates of a squat and ugly stucco building surrounded by high walls and a uniformed attendant having examined his credentials admitted him he had to wait a little while before a second attendant arrived to conduct him to the medical superintendent an elderly man who did not seem overwhelmed with joy at the honor mr briggerland was paying him i'm sorry i shan't be able to show you round, mr briggerland he said i have an engagement in town but my assistant dr carew will conduct you over to the asylum and give you all the information you require this of course as you know is a private institution i should have thought you would have got more material for your book in one of the big public asylums the people who were sent to norwood you know are not the mild cases and you will see some rather terrible sights you were prepared for that mr briggerland nodded he was prepared to the extent of the two full noggins of brandy moreover he was well aware that norwood was the asylum to which the more dangerous of lunatics were transferred dr carew proved to be a young and enthusiastic alienist whose heart and soul was in his work i suppose you are prepared to see jumpy things he said with a smile as he conducted mr briggerland among a stone vaulted corridor he opened a steel gate the bars of which were encased with thick layers of rubber crossed a grassy plot there were no stone flag paths at norwood and entered one of the three buildings which constituted the asylum proper it was a harrowing heart-breaking and to some extent a disappointing experience for mr briggerland true his heart did not break because it was made of infrangible material and his disappointment was counterbalanced by a certain vague relief at the end of two hours inspection they were standing out on the big playing fields watching the less violent of the patients wandering aimlessly about except one they were unattended by keepers but in the case of this one man two stalwart uniformed men walked on either side of him who is he asked briggerland that is a rather sad case said the alienist cheerfully he had pointed out many sad cases in the same bright manner he is a doctor and a genuine homicide luckily they detected him before he did any mischief or he would have been in broadmoor aren't you ever afraid of these men escaping asked mr briggerland you asked that before said the doctor in surprise no you see an insane asylum is not like a prison to make a good getaway from prison you have to have outside assistance nobody wants to help a lunatic escape otherwise it would be easier than getting out of prison because we have no patrols on the grounds the wards can be opened from the outside without a key and the night patrol who visits the wards every half hour has no time for any other observation would you like to talk to dr thun 
Mr. Briggerland hesitated only for a second. Yes, he said huskily. There was nothing in the appearance of the patient to suggest that he was in any way dangerous. A fair, bearded man with pale blue eyes, he held out his hand impulsively to the visitor, and after a momentary hesitation, Mr. Briggerland took it and found his hand in a grip like a vice. The two attendants exchanged glances with the asylum doctor and strolled off. "'I think you can talk to him without fear,' said the doctor in a low voice. Not so low, however, that the patient did not hear it, for he laughed. <laughs> "'Without fear, favor, or prejudice, eh? "'Yes, that was how they swore the officers at my court-martial.' "'The doctor was the general who was responsible for the losses at Caparetto, "'explained Dr. Carew. "'That was where the Italians lost so heavily. "'Of course, I was perfectly innocent,' he explained to Briggerland seriously, "'and taking the visitor's arm, he strolled across the field, "'and the doctor and the two attendants following at a distance.' Mr. Briggerland breathed a little more quickly as he felt the strength of the patient's biceps. "'My conviction,' said Dr. Thun seriously, "'was due to the fact that women were sitting on the court-martial, "'which is, of course, against all regulations.' "'Certainly,' murmured Mr. Briggerland. "'Keeping me here,' Thun went on, "'is part of the plot of the Italian government. "'Naturally, they do not wish me to get at my enemies, "'who I have every reason to believe are in London.' Mr. Briggerland drew a long breath. "'They are in London,' he said a little hoarsely. "'I happen to know where they are.' "'Really?' said the other one easily. Then a cloud passed over his face, and he shook his head. "'They are safe for my vengeance,' he said a little sadly. "'As long as they keep me in this place, pretending that I am mad, there is no possible chance for me.' The visitor looked round and saw that the three men who were following were out of earshot. "'Suppose I came tomorrow night,' he said, lowering his voice, "'and helped you to get away. What is your reward?' "'Number six, said the other in the same tone. His eyes were blazing. "'Do you think you will remember?' asked Briggerland. Thun nodded. "'You will come tomorrow night, number six, the first cubicle on the left.' he whispered. You will not fail me? If I thought you'd fail me. His eyes lit up again. I shall not fail you, said Mr. Briggerland hastily. When the clock strikes twelve, you may expect me. You must be Marshal Foch, murmured Thun, and then, with all a madman's cunning, changed the conversation as the doctor and attendants, who had noticed his excitement, drew nearer. "'Believe me, Mr. Briggerland,' he went on airily, "'the strategy of the Allies was at fault "'until I took up the command of the army.' Ten minutes later, Mr. Briggerland was in his car driving homeward, a little breathless, more than a little terrified at the unpleasant task he had just set himself, jubilant, too, at his amazing success. Jean had said he might have to visit a dozen asylums before he found his opportunity and the right man, and he had succeeded at the first attempt— yet he shuddered at the picture he conjured that climb over the high wall he had already located the ward for he had followed the general and the attendants and had seen him safely put away the midnight association with a madman he burst in upon jean with his news at the first attempt my dear what do you think of that his dark face glowed with almost childish pride and she looked at him with a half smile "'I thought you would,' she said quietly. "'That's the rough work done, at any rate.' "'The rough work?' he said indignantly. She nodded. "'Half the difficulty is going to be to cover up your visit to the asylum, "'because this man is certain to mention your name, "'and it will not be at all dismissed as the imagination of a madman. "'Now I think I will make my promised call upon Mrs. Meredith.'" End of chapter 12